Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and welcome to the Oculus webinar series. I'm really excited about tonight's presentation. Uh, tonight, we have a special presentation titled Contact Lens Fitting Question and Answers with Dr. John Gillies. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun because it's questions that have been either pre-submitted uh, by the audience, and we'll also have time at the end to take some of your questions. You'll notice that there's a Q&A chat board. Just put your questions into that chat board, and time permitting, we'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the lecture. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Gellies. Dr. Gellies um, is Director of Specialty Contact Lens Division of Cornea and Laser Eye Institute at the CLEI Center for Keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's Assistant Clinical Professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Science, and an Adjunct Clinical Professor at my alma mater, State University of New York College of Optometry. Um, and the Illinois College of Optometry and the New England College of Optometry. He's a Pro's Clinical Fellow and a Fellow of the Contact Lens Society of America, the Sclera Lens Society, the British Contact Lens Association, and the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. He's a board member on the Contact Lens Society of America and an executive board member of the International Keratoconus Academy, or IKA, and an advisory board member of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute. He's in, he's in the educational chair for the Intrepid Eye Society and International Keratoconus Academy. His clinical work is dedicated exclusively to specialty contact lens uh, and management of keratoconus and other corneal diseases, including ocular surface disease and post-corneal, post-surgical corneal conditions. He's also an investigator for multiple keratoconus and specialty contact lens related clinical trials at CLEI and a consultant for numerous related technology and ophthalmic companies. I couldn't think of a better person to invite to do a Q&A about contact lens fitting than John. So John, welcome. Uh, we're really excited to have you and the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to uh, go ahead and share my screen here. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, this uh, I think will be a really fun one. I've always wanted to do just a uh, contact lens Q and A, and you know, literally have you know the audience send in their questions beforehand. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as you could, and uh, you know, we'll just go from there. Have a little fun. Um, obviously, I want to thank Oculus for having me here tonight, and and really you know, indulging uh, <laughs> my my interest in uh, in this area and kind of, you know, allowing me to share not only my experiences with, you know, the, the uh, Oculus products and how those help in the uh, contact lens fitting, um, but also to, you know, just, just talk about contact lenses. This is, this is going to be a nice opportunity for us to really just have a chat around, uh, around the fireside, if you will. Okay. So let's, uh, let's hop into it. Obviously some disclosures, some acknowledgements to, uh, my colleagues here at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute, Dr. Peter Hirsch, Dr. Stephen Greenstein, uh, two of the greats in uh, keratoconus management and refractive surgery. So uh, what was the methodology for tonight? Well, we asked you guys to ask some questions. So you guys sent questions into Oculus, and about a week or two ago, I went ahead and uh, I reviewed them all. And what I did was I found the most commonly asked questions, and then some of them that were just you know easy ones that we could ask. I think we included virtually every question that we got. So hopefully there's enough time for us to go through them all tonight, okay? Um, basically what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a deep dive on some of the questions and some of the similar commonly asked questions that we had. And then I'm just gonna have very simple direct answers for simple questions that were asked. Um, however, I am gonna tell you that I cut out any question regarding uh, billing or fee questions. Uh, billing, I'm not an expert in, and fees, uh, I just am not going to talk about on a webinar. So, uh, what's our setup at our uh, our clinic here? Well, this is our setup. Uh, we have a Pentacam Wave AXL uh, somewhere in the back here. We also have a Pentacam HR, um, but we also have a uh, Oculus Corvus. So, what is this offering us? Well, this is giving us a full aspect of the entire eye. We get biometry of the eye, so we got our axial length covered. We have our aberometry covered so we can understand the, uh, the objective vision of the individual. 
We also have the tom uh, tomography there so that we can under understand uh, the uh, the structure of, uh, of the cornea of these individuals. And then we have the corvus, which helps give us some biomechanical data about the, uh, the cornea. Um, now, when we take a look at the advantages of having a appendicam, you know, it's giving us the ability to do full disease management. And I'm not going to harp on this tonight because you guys all know what, what this can do for, uh, you know, corneal disease management and why it's so important for us who are specializing in contact lenses to be able to view these corneas and to be able to follow these corneas for the diseases that they have going on, right? So we're getting full corneal metrics on these individuals if we just look at the metrics that we can get out of the pentacam, right? We're getting anterior curvature and elevation, we're getting densitometry, so the measurement of corneal clarity that's present. Uh, we can get looks at the shine flux so we can understand the shape and the profile of the corneas. We can understand the sagittal depth that's created off of the eyes. We can do a ton of different things with this. We can also look at the, uh, the thickness and the thickness distribution. And then we can look at really cool artificial intelligence that's in the device where we can look at screening metrics for finding uh, keratoconus and you know, risks for corneal ectasia at a much earlier state, right? Well, this is the cool overview that we can get now on the Pentacam Wave AXL. And this is actually perfect for those individuals who are going to be doing myopia management or any type of contact lens. But I really specifically wanted to mention myopia management because we're all so interested in it these days. And with the FDA approvals of an orthokeratology lens, the FDA approvals of a multifocal soft lens, uh, and you know the various different variety of, uh, of options for treating myopia that are down the road, we can talk about this screen specifically at nauseum just for days. You know, right away, I'm getting their uh, scotopic, photopic uh, pupil diameters in this. I get a retroillumination, so now I can see, you know, what the clarity level is of the media that I'm working with. So that can be helpful in, you know, patients that I might be considering for a multifocal contact lens for presbyopia, because then I can say, well, it looks like you may have an opacity in your lens, and you're not going to be a good candidate for a multifocal uh, soft contact lens, we actually need to go and get you cataract surgery, right? Uh, the other thing that we can look at is the aberrometry that's present. So for a patient that's not doing well in a lens, I can take a look at their higher order aberrations that are present and say, you know, we got a lot of higher order aberrations present here. And you know what? You also have a slightly irregular cornea. We actually shouldn't be fitting you in a standard soft lens. We should be fitting you in a specialty lens, right? So all these various different applications, and specifically for myopia control, we're getting biometry here. So now we got the axial length. We can follow all of these metrics over time and take a look at that. Now, I do want to share one quick case with you. This is an individual who has a, a level of keratoconus and we're using a soft contact lens to go ahead and correct her. And you can see just how much aberration that we have present in this individual. Uh, when we look at this, there's a significant amount that's present. Now, when we go ahead and I fit this individual in a, uh, a, uh, a scleral contact lens, you can see that we've significantly reduced the total RMS uh, in this eye. So let me go back here. We've reduced that quite a bit for this individual. When we went from a soft lens to this scleral lens, uh, we went ahead and improved that by a full, uh, you know, 50%, which is a big impact. That individual ended up gaining two lines. So we can look at a lot of different things. Now, the other thing that's kind of cool on this uh, is there's a uh, an IR image that comes in on this. And if you change the IR image here, you can actually look at the vessels that are going through uh, on the, uh, the uh, scleral lens haptic here and take a look at the impingement of that because it's going to highlight it uh, with the infra infrared. So it's actually a very, very useful, interesting uh, aspect of this. Now, as we all know, everything in contact lens fitting comes down to sagittal depth. It's the single most important factor in any type of contact lens fitting. And really what you're doing is you're looking at how deep is the lens, how deep is the eye, and the elevation that's there. And that's exactly what corneal tomography is giving you. And it's really affected by three main factors, which is your radius of curvature, your diameter, and your eccentricity. And that's all data that you can get from the, the, uh, the Pentacam. Uh, and you can coordinate that into the contact lenses that you make. So some of the things that we're going to touch on today are the various different lens modalities, soft lenses, custom soft lenses, 
corneal lens is hybrid only the piggyback lens. Yeah, it's scleral high ortho cave, the whole thing. Um, so let's get to some questions here. So this is one of the uh, the first questions that happened, which is how has your fitting methodology changed since COVID-19 regarding empirical versus trial lens fitting? Well, very little. <laughs> here is the thing though. I have been very pro empirical uh, lens fitting for a very long period of time. So many of you who know me are knowing that I'm using the data based off of these scans and we're using this data to help decide what sort of lenses we're going to use and then determine whether or not an individual should be fit in an empirically driven lens, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this individual with severe keratoconus and we're looking at the large color map that's provided on this. And what we're doing is we're looking at the IS ratio. So on the the uh, the meridian of Kmax, what we're looking at is the steepest point, and we're looking at the flattest point in a six millimeter optic zone. And what we're looking at is the difference there. And you can see that it's 13.5, right? Well, then what we do from here is we go ahead and we look at the elevation map. Now the elevation map that's classically presented to you on the Pentacam is with the float on. And that's how you get your nice little islands, which are helpful for diagnosing keratoconus. But they're not the most helpful in helping you design a contact lens and helping you choose what type of contact lens you're gonna use, right? So let's go ahead and let's talk about this. We're gonna float a, uh, a uh, best fit sphere through this cornea, right? So there it is, we floated it through the cornea. We're trying to connect as many points through the cornea and what we're doing is this little elevation that's here, that island, is just that little tip that's popping through the uh, the best fit sphere, right? Well, what we did in this one is we turned the float off, right? And when we have the float off, what you can see is we can see the differential and elevation across this cornea, which is actually the best way to talk about uh, you know irregular corneas, right? And what we did here was now we go ahead and we put the best fit sphere touching the apex of the cornea like this. And now you can see what we're looking at. We can see that there's this area of the cornea that dives away and the superior cornea is relatively elevated in comparison to that, right? So what happens if I put a corneal gas permeable lens on this eye? It's gonna drop. It's gonna go this direction towards the inferior area. So it's not so much the lens wants to balance on the cone, it's that the lens wants to go ahead and slide to the most depressed area of the eye. And that's the main reason why corneal gas permeable lenses don't work on individuals who are too advanced. However, there's cool software that can help to fix that, right? So this is using some of the wave software. Obviously on the uh, Pentacam, you can output this to just about any one of the uh, design softwares out there. So iSpace, Wave, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the ScanFit software from iPrint, um, all of these different modalities where you can import the data into them, right? And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. The example that I want to give here is, you know, towards a corneal lens. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the Wave lens here. And there's three different lenses that I'm showing you here, right? What we're looking at is the uh, superior and inferior of the cornea, right? So here's the superior, here's the inferior on all of these scans. And what you can see is this lens here, this simulation is a radially symmetric lens, which is just a spherical lens, right? And what you can see is this tremendous amount of inferior edge lift. And you can even see it here in the cross section, right? Well, what's going to happen to that lens? Well, it's going to want to slide inferiorly. Now, what happens if we just simply add a toricity to it or a geometrically symmetric lens, right? What you can see is we get improved alignment and it reduces that amount of uh, edge lift, but it doesn't eliminate it, right? So we're still going to get some drop uh, of that lens to the inferior portion of the cornea. Now, when we go ahead and we go full bore and we use an eight submeridian lens or a freeform lens, you can see that we can actually align this to this irregular cornea. And I do this frequently on individuals who have highly irregular corneas but can't wear a uh, you know a scleral lens or other types of lenses because their corneal physiology is not healthy enough 
to sustain a, uh, a uh, scleral contact lens. So what we're doing here is we're creating a lens that we really couldn't have created any other way. Um, so it's really giving you some advantages by pumping out really good data. Now, why are we using specifically Penicam data versus Placido disc topography data, right? We're using Penicam data because it can get a much more accurate look at a highly irregular cornea, right? In some of those irregular corneas, we're not able to capture the Placido on them but we're able to easily capture it with the shine flug uh, camera. So this is giving us a much better elevation surface to work off of to create these lenses. Um, now here's another one, right? This individual has a very little um, irregularity of their cornea. If we take a look at this, you know, their IS ratio is only two diopters. And when we look at the float, they almost have no real, uh, uh, you know, they do have a little central island, but nothing really that's, you know, knock you over the head perceivable. And when we turn off the float, you can see that there is some uh, vertical asymmetry here, but it's not a lot. And when we look at this individual, though, still what we can see is if we go with a radially symmetric lens, we still have some inferior edge lift there, right? But when we go to a geometrically symmetric lens, you can see how this aligns to the cornea very, very well. So just a toric lens is gonna work perfectly adequate for this eye, right? So now we kind of have an idea of where we could go with this individual. And generally what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna develop these lenses empirically. Now we can look at data-driven designs coming from the Pentacam. Now this is the CSP software that I have on my old Pentacam, but we're beta testing the new one uh, for the Pentacam Wave AXL. For, so for those of you who uh, have uh, purchased that device or are looking to purchase that device, uh, the CSP software is coming for that. You know, we've uh, we've taken this data set and I've put it into the Wave software. And what I've done is I've created my own lens, right, to my own surface data that's there, right? Um, what we've been able to do though, is I'm able to use this in multiple different ways, right? So just based off of the data that comes off of this, I'm able to look at this and say, you know, I have a 40 degree uh, uh, elevation here and a 32 degree uh, angle uh, to my sclera here. No wonder I've never had success in a scleral lens, right? I have this huge uh, uh, differential uh, between these meridians and I really could benefit from a quadrant specific design, right? And when I look at this, it totally is telling me why everything wasn't working well for me, right? So when I develop a lens that's freeform off of this, uh, currently I actually don't wear a wave lens for this. I wear a, uh, I wear a, uh, a, a scan fit lens on this eye. But when we look at this, you know, essentially what we're looking at is, uh, is the development of, of a very, very specific lens for my eye in my case, right? Um, now, I don't have any irregularity, but I do have very dry eyes. And when I'm in, uh, you know, environments that are high wind, so, you know, biking or, uh, you know, kayaking or anything like that, I want to have something that's going to be uh, covering my eyes so that I can keep my eyes open, you know, uh, and enjoy what I'm doing. So, uh, anyway, when we take a look at this, this is helping to, to uh, derive uh, the lenses here. And I can use this not just in a surface empirical uh, driven lens, but I can use this to understand how I might design a quadrant specific lens, right? I'd say, hey, you know, on this meridian, uh, you know, from nasal temporal, you know, this lens is probably going to line up on this meridian here. And I want to go ahead and uh, create a tighter uh, a temporal side uh, to this lens and a tighter inferior side to this lens to get this lens to center well on me so that I don't have the lens awareness and I can have a really good fitting lens. Um, so let's just share a little bit of uh, you know data here. This was uh, one that you've probably already seen, but you know it's always nice to revisit this. The purpose of this was looking at the number of lenses needed to finalize a fit and comparing uh, you know impressions to um, you know scan based data to uh, diagnostically fit data. And we did this as a retrospective review, and this looked at data from 2017 to 2019. And we looked at about 560 eyes, and what we found was diagnostically fitting a lens uh, to an eye took about 2.5 lenses, plus or minus one. Profilometry 
uh, was about uh, 1.9 plus or minus 0.7, and impression was 1.5 plus or minus 0.6. So in conclusion, what we can say based on this data is that profilometry design, uh, drive lenses are allowing me to make more sophistic designs, uh, sophisticated designs uh, than diagnostic uh, lenses, and that I'm getting to a much closer endpoint uh, with these profilometry driven designs than I am with diagnostic fitting di designs. And this is approaching the levels of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, uh, specificity to the, the ocular surface uh, that I would get with a physical mold of the eye. So it can be very, very, very helpful in this. Now, this is actually kind of a fun question, and there were multiple questions that came into this, is how do I determine what lens is going to go on what eye in a keratoconus patient, right? So when do I go with a scleral versus a corneal gas permeable lens? Well, I'm going to go ahead and address all the lenses out there. So corneal gas permeable lens, hybrid lenses, all the different things here, okay? Um, it's all about elevation differences, right? And in this, I'm going to talk specifically about IS ratios. So if you have a device that's only a placido uh, topographer, like a uh, keratograph uh, 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 5M, um, you can still use this methodology. So it's not just for those individuals with a, a Pentacam. It will help you on anything, right? So with so many things, how do we choose, right? One of the best papers, or rather not papers, but, uh, uh, gosh, what would you call it? Posters, posters uh, at GSLS over the years. And one of the most referenced ones uh, was uh, Frank Zhang's paper on corneal elevation differences and initial selection of corneal and scleral lenses. And what he found was if you had a 350 micron elevation difference, uh, between the uh, between the top and the bottom of the cornea, or the most elevated and the most depressed area on the cornea on the meridian, right? So here to here, um, if that was less than 350 microns, you had an 82% chance of success with a corneal gas permeable lens. But if it was greater than that, you should probably go to a scleral lens, right? Um, this elevation map has a lot of value. We actually use it in developing a, a surgical technique that we've been developing in the clinic here, where the idea is just to fill the depression to create more symmetry between the eye or between the uh, the cornea. So let's go ahead and look at this best fit sphere, right? You have to shut the float off on this to appreciate this this gradient difference, right? So you can see the elevated portion, the or the uh, burgundy portion, like up here. Uh, in the superior portion on the shine flug. And then you can see the depressed portion here, or that kind of pink portion, purpley portion, uh, down in that inferior portion here, right? So what I did was we did a retrospective review on uh, 450 keratoconus patients over a 30 month period of time. And we looked at currently successful lens wearers. Now all these individuals have a keratoconus um, we looked at about 737 eyes here, and we looked at soft ones, custom softs, RGPs, hybrids, piggybacks, and scleral lenses. And what we looked at was we found that in the successful patients, there was a, uh, a gradient being formed here, you know, and what we saw was that the uh, piggyback and scleral lenses didn't really have much of a difference between their K-max or K-means, so they could kind of be grouped together. And our custom soft lens and our RGPs uh, were very grouped together as well. And what we found there was that basically if they had similar parameters about their corneas, we probably could have a good outcome with those individuals in either one of those lenses. And then what we did was we went ahead and we created arbitrary cutoffs, which weren't all that arbitrary. What we found was 55 diopters was kind of the cutoff between uh, standard soft, custom soft, and RGP. And then going into a hybrid piggyback or scleral when we looked at K-max. And then when we did the same thing for K-mean and looked at 50 uh, diopters, we again had a split there, right? Custom soft, standard soft, RGP and hybrid on one side, piggyback and scleral on the other, right? So we're starting to get groupings that are forming. Now, the other thing that we looked at was IS ratio. So the asymmetry from top to bottom of the cornea uh, based on the corneal curvature maps, right? Uh, at the six millimeter optic zone. And what we, sat, what we found was that custom soft RGP and hybrid 
had generally a pretty similar thing. These guys were statistically insignificantly different from each other. And when we made a 10 diopter cutoff, we ended up with two groups again, right? So very interesting. We're starting to find some trends. What we then did was we looked at visual acuities on these individuals. And what we found was that all of these individuals, basically, no matter what uh, lens they were in, essentially any of the custom eyes on this um, that had uh, any sort of moderate to severe, van uh, severe uh, levels of keratoconus, all of these ended up with about an average of a 20-25 visual outcome, right? Whether they were in a custom soft, an RGP, a hybrid, a piggyback, or a scleral lens. Now, the piggyback is a little reduced. It's closer to a 20-30. Now, why is that? Well, because these were going on more severe eyes. These eyes ended up showing more levels of scarring, but also because we were using smaller optic zones and these tended to decenter a little bit, these individuals ended up with likely more higher order aberrations because of lens decentration. Now, what we found though that was kind of funny was all of these guys, we could separate them into groups that were statistically uh, insignificant, right? So we could see that our GP and our hybrids fell into one group, our piggybacks and our sclerals fell into one group, and our custom softs and our standard softs fell into another group. And this is grouping based on their manifest refractions, right? Then what we did was we looked at the ones that failed, right? And the ones that failed the most often were those in uh, RGPs, uh, followed by those in uh, softs and uh, in hybrid lenses. But what we found that was interesting was everybody failed. It didn't matter whether you were in any one of the designs, everybody failed. So it showed us that there's no such thing as a one lens for all patients, right? So what we did was then we looked at uh, various different factors on their corneal topography and looking at where we may find areas where there was a big difference in maximum keratometry, mean keratometry, or IS ratio. And what we found was that the guys who were successful uh, in uh, soft lenses and RGPs had lower K-maxes than those who failed, right? So the higher the K-max, the more likely these individuals were to fail. And you can see in the RGP, these guys were very severe that had failed in an RGP, whereas the guys who were successful in an RGP really weren't all that uh, severe. So it's telling us that they were too severe to wear an RGP or a soft lens, right? Mean K showed the exact same thing, right? Um, but it was statistically insignificant for everything else. But the thing that's the real kicker here is the asymmetry, right? The asymmetry in these eyes, when we look at this, was statistically significant for failures in soft RGP hybrid and piggyback lenses, right? So this is the most important factor in success or failure and how you're going to pick your lenses. So what did we do with all of this? We put it into an algorithm, right? So what we did was we looked at the asymmetry from the top to bottom of the cornea as being the most important factor. And if you had greater than 10 diopters in that, we had a K-max of over 55 diopters, we went into a scleral or, or a piggyback lens. The piggyback lens we used for individuals who couldn't be successful in the scleral lens because they had a hard time with handling um, or you know other issues there, just flank, frankly didn't want to wear that. Um, the other thing that we then did was if they were less than that, then we went to the manifest refraction visual acuity. And if we had visual acuity that was better than 20, 30, we could be very successful in a standard soft or custom soft lens and if we were worse than uh, 2030, then we had success in uh, RGP or hybrids. And we've been doing a perspective on this and the algorithm works. It stands very, very well. Um, now, what are we looking at when we compare this back to Frank Zhang's work, right? Well, this is actually very similar. When we look at an IS ratio of 10 diopters, that actually equaled an elevation of about 350 to 400 microns. So we're basically saying the same thing. Now, we need to confirm this, but the preliminary analysis that we did on this seems to correlate. So well, this is a pretty good way to decide what lens you're going into. So how do you objectively measure lens decentration? I love this question. The way that you do it is placido over topography, right? It's the best way to estimate this. So all of these eyes are done where we did a placido over topography and we look at where the pupil is in the center of the pupil and the movement of that lens to the center, right? So you can see all these examples here. 
this is a multifocal here. You can see our multifocal is down low. Our pupils up here were decentered by about a, a millimeter. And you can see that we are, uh, you know, what axis we need to rotate this on and how much we would need to move it, uh, you know, nasally and superiorly to center that, right? And this can be very helpful in understanding why individuals are having a hard time uh, with their scleral lens or their soft lens or any one of their lenses, their multifocal lenses, because then we can see where the optics actually are in relationship to the pupil. And then we can decide how that gradient of power is going to affect the vision, right? If we have a big gradient of power, like on this high eccentricity lens, we're actually creating a coma-like optical shape, right? And this is going to create more aberration for that individual and reduce their vision. Now, this is the same eye with a low eccentricity lens on it. And you can see we've eliminated that gradient there. This individual did tremendous in a lower eccentricity lens on this eye because we were able to eliminate that gradient. Now, in this multifocal case, we decentered the optics to put them more central. And this is that eye now that we had the, uh, the decentered optics. And you can see that if we go ahead and we use a tangential view, it's even easier to see where these optics are and what they're doing on the front surface, right? So this is the way to analyze that in a very low, uh, low uh, issue way. Uh, now, in a keratograph of 5M, that's exactly how you would do it. Um, uh, you know, it would be the ideal instrument to be able to do this. Now, what is the thinnest lens thickness you will use for a scleral and orthokeratology lens? Uh, the lowest that I've ever gone is a 0.2 millimeter uh, center thickness on a scleral lens. Below that, I had problems with breakage. Um, you know, warpage, sure, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that I totally believe that uh, lens warpage is really a problem in those lenses because the way that you can develop them is you can create a thin center but then you create a thicker mid periphery on it and that acts as kind of your splint, if you will, to hold that central area a little bit more stable. In orthokeratology, uh, 1.5, um, you know, again, I find that lenses that are thinner than that, we tend to have breakage during handling. Um, do I like to go to lenses this thin? Occasionally, there are times when it makes sense. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well. This is kind of a trick question. What lens materials do you prefer? Um, well, I like lens materials that are compatible with the patient's physiology. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we start getting into DKs and things like that, and wedding angles and, and those sorts of things. Um, but essentially what I'm trying to do is trying to find a lens material that is gonna wet well. I'm trying to find a lens that is going to not compromise the corneal physiology so that the cornea is remaining in good shape. Um, and I'm trying to just make sure that this is gonna work well for the individual. And I can use various different uh, uh, material parameters uh, to uh, modify that and improve the overall uh, outcome for the individual. So how long should patients be out of their soft or rigid corneal lenses before scanning a patient's eye? Well, that is a variable question depending on the level of tissue warpage, right? So when I've looked at refitting an individual who has been a previous scleral lens wearer to wanting to do a prophylometry or a scan-based uh, scleral lens fit, right? I have those individuals out of their lens for minimum of one week for their scleral shape to go back uh, into shape. Now, if they were wearing a lens that was impinging on any area and were starting to get, you know, a hypertrophic uh, conjunctiva or anything that looks like a, a, you know, a granuloma forming, I'll hit them with steroids and make them wait for two to three weeks before I go and rescan them. Um, so that, that's one way to look at this. On the cornea, because you get epithelial molding uh, and the epithelium needs to go back into place, you know, those individuals I'm waiting for a certain period of time as well. Now, unfortunately, I was going to put in an ortho K uh, uh, patient into this, uh, but I could not find the scans for the life of me 
uh, that were showing that, you know, this ortho K patient uh, that was, you know, a minus two went back to their natural position uh, with their epithelial mapping uh, in a, a, a two week period of time. Whereas an individual who had a minus six, it took them about six weeks. So it depends on the level of tissue movement that we're making, right? You're moving conjunctival tissue with scleral lenses. You're moving epithelium with uh, with ortho K and corneal lenses. Um, so again, the best uh, rule that I can have for you is have them out of their lens for about a week to two weeks. Have them come back in, evaluate it, and say, you know, is this a, is this a pretty reasonable shape? And if you don't feel like it is, have them stay out of it for a longer period of time and follow back up. Uh, once you have a scan that looks pretty good, um, then you go from there, okay? Uh, now, how do I handle an orthokeratology lens that's adherent to the cornea in the morning and is difficult to remove? Generally, what I do is I have them try to release the suction. So what do I mean by that? I have them put a topical, um, a uh, you know, an artificial tear on the eye. I have them take their finger and take their uh, take their finger on their lower lid margin, and I have them place that just below uh, the edge of the lens. And what I have them do is I have them push in a little bit, a few times, right at that area. And what that's doing is it's trying to release the pressure of the lens on the eye and create a little tear pump underneath the lens so that we're now uh, releasing that kind of adherence and getting some of those artificial tears underneath the lens, then to create some of that lens movement. And then once that lens is moving, go ahead and take it off of the eye. And that's how you get a difficult uh, lens uh, off of the eye. So do I fit uh, keratoconus patients with orthokeratology? Nope, I do not. When you look at a patient with keratoconus, they have natural epithelial remodeling. And the way that epithelial remodeling works is essentially epithelium is going to move in a fashion to try to create a dome shape out of the cornea despite what is going on with the stroma underneath it. So what do I mean by that? Let's take an individual who has a, a myopic LASIK ablation, right? We've created an oblate shape to their corneal stroma. What happens to the epithelium on that individual? It becomes hypertrophic in the center of the cornea. So it stacks in the middle to create a more dome shape to that cornea. In contrast, in a patient with keratoconus, the epithelium over the center of the cornea, or in this case, the apex, of the cornea is going to thin. So the epithelium is thinner over the apex. And then it thickens towards the base of the cone, right? So you get what's known as an epithelial donut pattern, right? Very similar to the sort of pattern that you're going to get with an orthokeratology lens, right? And how does an orthokeratology lens work? Well, it's thinning the epithelium in the center and heaping the epithelium in the mid periphery to create a tabletop or oblate sort of shape, right? So if we already have that epithelial movement in a, uh, in a cornea with keratoconus, and now we're trying to move that epithelium even more, what ends up happening is we're gonna cause insult to that cornea because epithelium can only get so thin before we start having disruption. So do I fit it on uh, KCIs? Absolutely not. And the other thing that I wanna bring up is that in individuals with keratoconus, or excuse me, uh, that are going into orthokeratology, it's imperative that you have data from a tomographer so that you can understand what you're fitting an orthokeratology lens on, right? Think about this, a refractive surgeon doesn't just use a corneal topographer, right? They use a corneal tomographer on an eye because they wanna know, is there any chance that there is a corneal ectasia that may happen for this individual, right? They want to know that before they do a corneal-based refractive procedure, right? And if they find that there are suspicious findings, many of these individuals will revert to a safer corneal-based procedure. So instead of doing a LASIK or a SMILE, they'll then convert to doing maybe a PRK, 
or they'll abandon corneal-based refractive surgery and go to lens-based refractive surgery, right? Well, we should think about the same thing when we're going to do myopia control, right? We have multiple different modalities for myopia control out there. We have topical therapy and atropine. We have multifocal soft lenses. We have orthokeratology. And soon we're going to have uh, the use of mo myopia control spectacle lenses, right? So we have these options there. So not everybody is going to be a good candidate for orthokeratology. And this is not to say that orthokeratology doesn't work, it works phenomenally but we want to make sure that we're making the right choice for this individual, right? If we're going to start orthokeratology on an individual who's eight years old and may not have anterior obvious signs of keratoconus uh, on a, a corneal-based topography, but if we got tomography on them, we might find that they're thinner than average, or we might find a posterior elevation that would make us say, hey, you know, maybe we don't want to manipulate the corneal shape on this individual. We want to follow this individual quite closely for changes for keratoconus, but we do want to still try to manage their myopia. So let's go ahead and put them in a soft multifocal instead of an orthokeratology lens, or let's go ahead and do a soft multifocal plus atropine or just atropine. It's directing whether you're going to do a corneal-based therapy or you're going to do an alternative therapy, right? So that's how I see the Penicam fitting into this area. So what do I do differently when fitting a scleral lens for dry eye? Well, I use a larger diameter and I focus more on wettability of these lenses, right? So essentially what I'm looking at is I try to cover as much of the ocular surface as possible in these individuals. Now, when you say dry eye, I take that as a severe ocular surface patient. I don't generally fit a, you know, an individual who's having kind of a tough time with their soft lens into a scleral lens and expect them to do much better. Generally, those individuals, you know, they need aggressive, uh, uh, you know, ocular disease therapy. And honestly, it, it, sometimes it's just the fit of the soft lens. I can't tell you how many individuals come into my office saying, I have terrible dry eye and I can't wear my soft lenses when in fact it's just the mechanical fit of the soft lens that they're in because people aren't paying attention to the importance of movement and stability in a soft lens. You know, if we put a soft lens on and we just go, yeah, looks great, see you later. Um, you know, a lot of these individuals are gonna have problems and using uh, the, you know, the methodology of picking a lens based on its sagittal depth. So if you use the uh, AFE van der Warp sort of you know, a uh, contact lens sagittal depth sort of method of fitting lenses, um, you can get a really good outcome on a lot of these individuals and solve a lot of their soft lens problems. Um, but in the severe ocular disease patients, I generally am using very large diameters in these individuals. In general, I don't fit less than an 18 millimeter lens anymore. Uh, the vast majority of my lenses are on average 18 millimeters. Uh, but when we go to the severe ocular surface patients, I'm trying to get 20 millimeters on their eye uh, or sometimes even more to try and cover as much of that ocular surface so that the, the ocular surface can heal underneath it. Um, how do I determine scleral lens diameter when fitting a patient? Generally, it's based on the anatomy of the eye. Uh, when we talk about the anatomy, I'm looking at the individuals and by anatomy, I'm looking at anything unusual. So what's gonna make me pick a lens under 18 millimeters for an individual, right? We know that we all have edge lifts. We know that we can create these very sophisticated profilometry de uh, derived or rather surface derived uh, lenses for a, uh, an individual that can take into account the undulations of their irregular anatomy. So what anatomy is gonna make me say, hey, I need a smaller lens, right? Well, generally, those are going to be things like symblepheron, right? So for those individuals who have, you know, cicatricial conditions uh, where we're going to have symblepheron formation, so individuals like, uh, you know, our pemphigoid patients or Stevens-Johnson's patients or any of those severe ocular surface patients, chemical burns, things like that, where we're going to have symblepheron, 
those individuals, I'm going to go ahead and pick a smaller diameter lens so I'm not rubbing up against those symblepheron, right? Now, when we talk about uh, diameters as well, well, I forgot my train of thought on that, but we'll come back to that once I remember. <laughs> um, so what is the optimal clearance of a lens before and after a scleral lens settles, and how long do I wait to assess a fit? Well, it's dependent on the physiology, right? So the optimum clearance, you know, basically I look at this as the optimum clearance is not touching the cornea and less than 200, right? Somewhere in that area is right where we want to be. Um, and it's dependent on the physiology because obviously the tear film is the most, uh, you know, the largest barrier based on the science uh, to the oxygen that's going to get to the cornea, right? It has the lowest decay out of your system. So if you make a much deeper lens lake, um, you have the possibility of uh, starving out a cornea. Now, a cornea that's at risk for starvation is going to have a problem with it, right? So that's where the idea of a scleral lens challenge comes in, right? We're going to put a lens on an eye and we're going to watch how that cornea responds to that scleral lens being in, right? So on those guys who have suspicious corneal findings, right? Let's say we have an old graft, right? Um, that individual, I may want to see how they're going to respond to a scleral lens uh, before we do anything uh, with uh, with actually, uh, you know, having them wear a lens for a long period of time. So maybe what I'll do is I'll have them put on a lens and I'll have them go home for a few hours and come back in at the end of the day. And what I'll see is I'll see, are there any microcysts present? Were there any bulli that formed? You know, are they getting a Sattler's veil? Is their visual acuity decreasing? And if that's the case, I may reduce the the, the apical clearance uh, even more. I may go ahead and, uh, you know, fenestrate a lens or loosen a lens to go ahead and try and get, you know, more, uh, more tear uh, exchange or uh, oxygen to the cornea via the bubbles. Um, those sorts of things. So it's all dependent on the physiology. How long do I wait? Well, I don't put much stock into, you know, having to have a perfect clearance when they're uh, when they're there during a fitting. I really don't care. So long as it's clearing the cornea, uh, you know, I I know that I'm going to be fine. So generally, when I put a lens on an eye, yeah, I want to see that we got about two to 300 microns of clearance or even more because I know I can modify that and bring that down, right? Um, so I'm not a big fan of this whole, yeah, put a lens on and let's wait an hour and all that. I do my fits very rapidly and then I dispense my lens and I have them come back in two weeks. That way they're as maximally settled as possible uh, and those are patients that don't have a, a, a compromised physiology. Um, but I'll dispense and I'll have them come back in two weeks and I'll just see where they're where they're at. You know, how has this lens settled onto their eye? That way I can make the most intelligent changes uh, to that lens. Um, and I'm not wasting my time with excess follow ups and I'm uh, optimizing an outcome for an individual so that I can get faster uh, success. Um, now, the newest materials out there, um, you know, we want to talk about physiology. You know, we can't talk about that without having a lens material talk, right? So we can look at all the various different uh, types of uh, material. And if we look at this, if we kind of make the cutoff at uh, right around, um, you know, equal lens up to uh, equal lens two, um, we got our kind of sub, our, our kind of, you know, 60 to 80 DK. And then if we go to our kind of tyros around here, uh, you know, we have our 100 DK materials uh, right around here. And then if we go to our Boston, or excuse me, our Optimum uh, Extreme and up, we got our 125s, uh, 140s, 150s, and then our newest ones that are in red, which are Optimum, our Menicon Z, and our uh, in, uh, uh, Acuity 200, these ones are really our ultra high DKs, and this is what I'm gonna use in an individual uh, with a compromised cornea. Um, so let's talk a little bit about corneal edema, right? This is one of the potential uh, contraindications to scleral lens wear. Um, 
uh, you know, Daddy did, and uh, Elise uh, did this really great uh, review article looking at potential uh, issues there. One of them being, uh, you know, corneal edema in uh, in individuals who have at-risk corneal grafts, right? Um, and if you look at uh, it, scleral lens-induced corneal edema, what you find is it's the uh, the inferior temporal area. Uh, that tends to swell in these individuals, right? And why do we get more, uh, uh, you know, um, excuse me, why do we get more, uh, you know, swelling in those areas? Well, it's because the lenses are going to decenter and we're going to get more, uh, you know, elevation over that area or more lens depth over that area, right? And uh, there was this great article, this is Shears Group, um, I believe this is the uh uh gosh uh oh gosh I forget the name of uh, the clinic it's uh it's on Long Island uh, Norwell Norwell uh uh you know health system uh what you can see here was when they were doing pros here you know they found that there was you know problems with uh with endothelial dysfunction patients that can potentially limit their success um, because they have, uh, you know, reduced uh, endothelial function and you can get corneal edema on these individuals. Um, so these individuals may be likely to fail based on that. Um, now, though, I want to, uh, to contrast that, though. In this patient, this patient had a huge uh, clearance. You can see written right there, uh, they had a clearance in this uh, lens of over... 1100 microns right and they were using it uh for the for the treatment of lens toes or lid ptosis right so you create that extra volume to hold that lids up and you can see that this individual is you know still has a very healthy cornea over all these years right so it really is up to whether or not the cornea is up to the uh, the stress of the contact lens right so this cornea, this was a graft I fit and blew up. You can see this is after three hours of lens wear. And you can see this guy had a uh, an ECC of 14, uh, 1,400 cells, right? Uh, you know, we always hear that classic, uh, oh, 800, uh, you know, cells, we should start being cautious about it. Well, it's really how does your patient respond to lens wear, right? This guy has more than that, but you can see clearly after uh, you know three hours of wear, his cornea has become significantly edematous. You can see all the microcysts in it. Um, that was just a bad day, right? Um, you know, and oxygen transmissibility of uh, materials is not the only factor, right? So you know, you can see these uh, these uh, lenses, uh, you know, these vaults that are huge, and these corneas are very healthy in some individuals. So it's totally up to that. Um, but this is a patient that I had seen uh, with a graft. Uh, we did a low DK system, meaning 300 microns or uh, 400 microns of lens thickness uh, with 100 DK material, which is what most individuals, or no, 3, 0.35 lens thickness uh, with uh, 100 DK material, which most of us use, uh, and uh, 300 microns of clearance. And you can see this corneal graft swelled up. You can see the center is the pre-wear. This is the two weeks post-wear. And you can see we gained uh, about 50 microns across the cornea. Whereas when we then switched him to a high DK system, uh, so this was uh, with the low DK system in the center, and two weeks after wearing that high DK system, you can see that we lost all of that corneal swelling. So the eye you know, de-swelled. So clearly this individual did benefit from lower clearance, thinner lens, higher DK material, right? So uh, the proof is in there in your cornea and the way that it's, uh, you know, it responds. So what's the optimal lens, uh, limbo clearance of scleral lens? Uh, not touching, that's my answer on this one, right? We don't want to be excessive, but we don't want to touch, right? And what's the best way to evaluate limbal clearance if you don't have any uh, a, uh, an OCT? Uh, sodium fluorescein, it's a great way to do it. Um, what we're gonna talk about right now is just how do we evaluate a lens efficiently on these eyes, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at lens edges. And what we do is we do cross evaluation. So if I'm looking at the nasal side, like I am on this upper image here, I want my light source coming from the temporal side and across 
And what I can see is, is that lens aligned or is it elevated? If it's elevated like it is here, you'll see that shadow being cast and that's telling me that I need to tighten up that edge. Conversely, the, uh, the image below, what you can see is that lens edge is digging into that eye. Not only are we getting a, a impingement of those vessels right at the edge there, but we also don't cast a shadow, right? So you can see that that's not really there. Now we can also use this with the lens off and we can evaluate what's going on with the haptic. You can see here that this, six, uh, this 15 millimeter lens that was fit on this eye is creating this giant trench on this eye, right? So what we're seeing is that we need to widen the haptic on this eye, so make the lens overall diameter bigger so that we can float the lens a little bit better on this eye so that we don't dig into it so much. Um, again, we can also look for little findings like these little micro bubbles, which are caused by a little bit of edge lift. Now, if we use cobalt blue on these individuals, right, this is me painting fluorescein on the eye. This is how we're going to talk about, uh, you know, edge lift on an individual, right? You can see that fluorescein already bleeding into the back of the lens. And you can see that the lens is moving a little bit, right? So if we have this, what's going to happen to this individual? Well, we're going to have a case where they are building up debris underneath the lens, and this is going to cause some problems for midday fogging and other things like that. How do I solve that? Well, I, I fit them better. I make that lens align better. Um, the other thing to look at is after lens removal, right? This will help us judge what we're going to do with a haptic um, because you can see the areas of compression. We can see the, the areas of hyperemia. Uh, very, very well. Um, and that's a really, really important thing to uh, remember. The other thing here is we can put fluorescein on the eye and we can watch for a gutter, right? So if we run that one more time from the top, you can see that fluorescein just falling down that gutter there, right? So that's what we want to look at. So how often do I utilize a toric haptic uh, in a scleral lens fit? And when do I use freeform lens designs? literally every single eye. There has not been an eye that I have fit since 2017, no, 2016, that I haven't used a toric, at least a toric haptic on uh, and up from there to a freeform design. How do I manage uh, front surface deposits and non-wettability in scleral lenses? I use tangible hydropeg. I use lens material that's made out of a lower wetting angle or, or that has a lower wetting angle and I'll use alternative solutions. So why does the lens material matter, right? Well, it's your choice. You know, unlike commodity lenses, I can pick what lens material I want, you know, and, and the shape that I want for that individual. So we want to really look at the wetting angle, right? So lower wetting angle is going to equal better wetting. Um, and the example being here, you know, C has a better wetting angle than A. A is a more hydrophobic uh, 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 surface, whereas uh, C is a much more hydrophilic, um, you know, and uh, we can use hydropeg for this, right? A uh, plasma treatment is really an ionization of uh, the, the, uh, the surface of a lens um, by bombarding it with plasma state oxygen. Um, this cleans the lens very, very well, and it negatively charges the uh, surface for a little bit, um, but it, uh, it, it's not lasting. By the time you handle it and rub the lens, that ionization is really gone because it's just the first nanometers uh, or the first nanometer of the, uh, the, the material, whereas hydropeg is an actual polymer encapsulation of a lens which then can uh, uh, make the lens uh, much more uh, comfortable. How do I manage midday fogging into reservoir de de debris in a scleral lens? Well, you're gonna improve your lens fit and how do you handle conjunctival prolapse and uh, fogging in a, a scleral lens? Again, you're gonna improve your lens fit to do that. So let's talk a little bit about limbal clearance, right? The best ways to evaluate limbal clearance is two ways, right? One is with an optic section where you're taking a look at what's going on on the limbus. The other one is to take the lens off. Taking the lens off and putting a little bit of stain is going to show you 
uh, areas of microcyst and touch, right? You don't get this sort of pattern like what you see here on a limbus unless you're touching and rubbing that with a lens. Um, the other thing with a, uh, you know, a post uh, lens to uh, <laughs> post lens reservoir uh, fogging, again, that happens because your lens haptic alignment is not good. You need to go back and look at the lens edge and make sure that it's actually aligning, uh, lining with the uh, the scleral tissue there. Now, in some cases, you'll have lenses that are tight where they're not creating that, but you're still getting excessive limbal uh, uh, or uh, excessive buildup of mucins and debris in the back of the lens. Well, that's coming usually from sick eyes or eyes where you have excessive limbal clearance and it's causing, you know, you, you've created too big of a, a corneal chamber, too large of a corneal chamber diameter, and that's creating suction force on that conjunctiva and forcing those mucins into the, the uh, tear layer. So what sort of uh, cleaning and disinfection do I recommend for uh, scleral lenses? Hydrogen peroxide and uh, vial sterile saline. That's the way to go. You know, we have, uh, you know, present and past sorts of ways of looking at this. You know, we got Addy packs. I don't use it because it's off label. You have Puri lens and scleral fill, which are uh, both preservative free sterile uh, saline. Um, but they both have buffers in them, a borate buffer that's in them. And because of that, that's not my first choice. Um, I use uh, Menicon uh, lacquer peer, uh, non-preserved, non-buffered, simply because uh, it's got nothing else in it, right? All of these are good options, though. I just use that because it has literally nothing in it. If I'm having a problem with it, a patient says it's stinging the eye, it's burning the eye, I'll move to one that's buffered, right? Um, the other things, though, that we'll look at in, uh, you know, newer uh, types of, uh, of fill solution is going to be fill solutions that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, new to the market. So you have Vibrant View, which is a preservative-free, unbuffered saline. Um, and then you have Nutrafil, which is a... <coughs> a uh, oh, man, I am out of water, unfortunately. Um, uh, Nutrafil, which has uh, potassium, calcium, and magnesium added to it, as well as has a phosphate buffer. Um, in a study that was done uh, by uh, by Jenny's group over at uh, you know uh, uh, Ohio State, uh, they found that uh, uh, Nutrafil um, had statistically significant improvements in burning, stinging, grittiness, dryness, blurriness, and the thing that was very funny was they actually reported uh, improvements in visual acuity. Um, so very, very interesting stuff. It, it works very well. I recommend it to my patients as well. Um, but these are just kind of my, my uh, go-tos on that. Um, the Vibrant View has a novel uh, you know, hygiene system to it as well. Uh, hypochlorous acid uh, for uh, lids and hands um, as well. Um, the other one that's uh, kind of interesting is uh, you know tangible boost. This is how I keep up the maintenance on uh, on the hydropeg lenses so that they continue to feel good on the individuals. This is essentially maintenance to the polymer chain of the uh, hydropeg. It essentially uh, is creating a bonding of the chains of uh, polyethylene glycol uh, so that they're maintained on the surface. Uh, wow, we are uh, we are getting to a little over an hour here. Um, I'm going to just try to wrap these last little questions up here, um, and then we'll go ahead and turn it over to some uh, questions, and then we'll be done for the night. I'll try to wrap this up in the next uh, five minutes here. So do I use uh, PRISM to stabilize toric optics? Nope, I do not. I use uh, toric haptics to stabilize the eyes. Virtually every single eye can, uh, you know, has some level of toricity or asymmetry, and using that asymmetry and finding a lens that's going to fit to that asymmetric scleral shape uh, and using you know, your profilometry to help you figure out that level of uh, asymmetry uh, from the Penicam, you can use this to devise a very stable scleral lens on the eye, and then you don't have to use any sort of prism ballasting on your scleral lenses 
to get them to stabilize because the lens is going to lock itself in place. Then you can put the optics on the front. Um, and you know, obviously, we have all these different options. You don't have to use a dyed, a uh, you know, a profilometry driven lens design. The data that you're going to get from the Penicam and from those profilometry uh, uh, scans, that CSP scan, what you're going to get are the types of modifications that you may want to use. You know, you may find that you only need to use a toric if there's symmetry there. You may find that there's a lot of asymmetry and you want to use a quadrant. Uh, you may also find that, you know, you want to use uh, different profiles based on the corneas that you're seeing, whether it's an oblate or a prolate sort of shape. Um, you know, if we look at Visser, they find that a vast majority of eyes are having a good improvement with using a, a toric scleral lens on them, a better comfort, better centration of the eyes, a better visual acuities. Again, there was a, a clinical outcomes done on a, a quadrant specific design. Um, and again, we find a superiority when we use you know, more uh, highly sophisticated uh, lens designs on individuals to create a better outcome on them. And with that, whew, we finally wrapped that up. So Bill, you wanna uh, hop on, deliver me some uh, some questions that uh, maybe we didn't get covered. And uh, let's, uh, let's keep it somewhat brief since I went over. <laughs> I think, Lil, well, it's amazing what you did cover. I was taking notes and I, I couldn't write as fast as you were speaking. It's amazing. <laughs> um, for everyone on the webinar, we this will be recorded and we'll share the recording. So if you also did get to take all the notes you'd like, you can re listen to portions of it. Uh, we'll send those links out shortly. Um, but I have one or two quick questions for you, John, before we wrap it up. Um, Absolutely. We talked a lot about sterile lenses um, during the last part, but I have a couple of questions about orthopaid lenses. And I know in my experience, the trend over time has been for larger and larger lenses for a lot of good reasons. In fact, Absolutely. Yeah, some people even fitting um, semi-scleral lenses for orthopaid, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which was new for me. Can you just comment a little bit about um, your diameter selection on orthopaid and whether or not you're doing myopia management versus non-myopia management, things like that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So my diameter of choice, I'm always trying to get the biggest lens that I can get onto the eye for the most stability. And the other thing that's extremely important to think about is as I'm adding diameter to the eye, I'm adding width to the area of the alignment that's going to happen on the cornea, right? Orthokeratology is 100% about creating a sealed system so that you can create a, a what would you call this? It's it's like a, um, a, a hydrodynamic force or a suction force in the correct areas of the lens to go ahead and manipulate that ortho or, or to manipulate that epithelium, right? It's not about smashing the central cornea. It's about redistributing the, uh, the cornea into the relief or, or the epithelium into the relief areas, right? So if I have a wider periphery uh, uh, on this eye because I've gone to a larger diameter, I can then get more area for the, <coughs> excuse me, running out of uh, water here, so I'm getting a little hoarse. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, if I can extend the, uh, the uh, PCs on this, essentially, I can get better alignment and thus better seal and create better force on this. Um, it's also more comfortable for the patient too because the lens doesn't move around quite as much. Generally, my rule of thumb on this is to go 90% of HVID uh, to 95%, somewhere in that area. So I'm covering the vast majority of the, of the cornea. Um, and uh, I, I forgot the second portion of this. Oh, if I'm gonna go for you know, a myopia control, uh, my optic zone sizes, I'm generally going to ensure that the size of my optic zone is very small. I'm trying to get a, a optic zone on this that's somewhere related to their pupil size, right? So I want to make sure that my reverse curve is right at the edge of the pupil um, because what I want is I want to create that gradient within the pupil, right? And you're going to get that if you create a very small optic zone. 
Whereas for an adult that wants to wear orthokeratology, you know, I'm going to try to create a very large optic zone so that I can give them good quality of vision, uh, you know, during nighttime driving or other low light situations. But if they're, you know, over 40 years old, I may use a small zone to increase the uh, the spherical ace, uh, rather the spherical aberration, so that they can get more of a multifocal effect out of it. So, you know, just several different things to think about there. So the, the last part, obviously, the challenge historically, and, I, and I've been doing it with it for a couple of decades. Um, mm -hmm. Are you using biometry to monitor um, the myopic control auto case that you're doing? Um, and if so, how often do you perform it? So, so I, I think of it like this. So, so just like I would be monitoring keratoconus or glaucoma, I'm going to monitor the axial length in myopia as being the most important factor in following the disease as of right now, based on the literature that we have, right? Um, I will look at this very similarly to using, uh, you know, the anterior corneal curvature metrics or the posterior elevation metrics or the thickness metrics that we have in uh, keratoconus, right? Um, what we're doing is we're using this axial length as one of the primary uh, outcomes and then we're also using our refraction on it. So generally on an individual who seems to be relatively under control or slow progression in myopia, I may only measure them, uh, you know, or a lower risk rather, um, I may only measure them every six months, but somebody who's at high risk, I may see them every three months if they were a rapid progressor before starting myopia therapy, right? Uh, and then as I start to feel more comfortable with their stabilization, I'll start to extend out the visits to every six months. It certainly has become easier in my clinic now that I have one machine that does both, that does everything. Okay. Instead yeah. of training a technician to get them over to the IOL master or the other, whatever instrument you're using, it's yeah. certainly a lot easier now to just routinely take those numbers, whether you use them or not, look at them or not. Um, I think it's great. I, I think the other challenge I just wanted to comment the last thing on is, is you talk to parents of myopia controlled kids, um, and if you are talking about biometry, I, I'm guessing that you have the conversation that they're supposed to get longer as they get older, and you, so you, you you set their expectations about what axial length changes you are expecting to have versus ones that you don't expect. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very interesting sort of evolving field for all of us. You know, I think our next you know uh, area that this might go into is you know well likely going to go into is choroidal thickness measurements and you know we're we're, we're going to see a whole bunch of various different aspects of this. But one of the things that I think is going to be really interesting is looking at aberrometry and the way that aberrometry specifically affects an individual and maybe how we can use aberrometry uh, or customized orthokeratology to create aberrometry uh, of an eye that's customized to an individual's uh, you know, eye to maximize uh, the ortho or excuse me, the myopia control effect. So it's gonna be really, really interesting. We'll see what happens. That is just outstanding. Uh, John, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us tonight. I learned more in this one hour than I have in a lot of webinars over the past year. So this has been great and I hope everyone else enjoyed it also. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can send them into applications at oculususa.com. We'll be happy to, uh, Dr. Galilee will be happy to answer those for you. And um, again, really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in tonight and have a great evening. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you.